All right, so in 405 CE, Tao Yuanming left the last government post he was to hold and returns to his farmstead. This is chronicled in one of the most well-known poems called The Return. In the preface, he states, After a few days and with further reflection, I felt like going back. Why? Because my natural disposition is to be myself and it cannot be found through pretense or force. Hunger and cold might be intense, but going against myself makes me sick. The poem then goes on to recount his joy in reuniting with his family and neighbors and to tell of his hard but rewarding work in the fields. The poem then concludes, Climbing the eastern bank, I'll out, out a relaxed whistle and write poetry next to the clear flowing stream. I'll ride the transformations of the world until my return is finished, delighting in what heaven has given me. Why doubt anymore? Shortly after this, he wrote another version of his homecoming, which seems to have been composed as the optimism of the earlier version of the poem faded away. I would like to use this poem called Returning to Live on the Farmstead as a way of framing the relevant issues of my presentation. You can find the poem on your handout. So it's a little lengthy, but I think it's worth reading. <clears throat> when young, I did not fit in with the common tune. My nature was rooted in a love of hills and mountains. By mistake, I fell into a dusty net, and all of a sudden, 30 years had passed. The trapped bird longs for his former woods. The fish in the pond dreams of his old lake. I break up the uncultivated land on the border of the southern wilds and keep to my awkwardness in returning to the farm. My homestead is a couple of acres. My thatched roof covers several rooms. Elms and willows shade the back eaves. Peach and plum trees unfold in front of the hall. The distant village is hazy and indistinct. Smoke from households floats gentle and soft. A dog barks far down some lane. A cock crows from atop a mulberry tree. In my home, there is no dust or disorder. A bare room allows for plenty of repose. Trapped in a cage for so long, I can finally go back to being myself. Out here in the countryside, there are few worldly affairs. In my narrow lane, carriages rarely appear. The bright sun is blocked out by my bramble gate. The bare room keeps out dusty thoughts. Sometimes I go into the village. Bending the grass, the villagers come and go. When we see each other, there is no convoluted talk. We only discuss the growth of our hemp and mulberry trees. Day after day, my hemp and mulberry trees grow taller, and day after day, my fields grow wider. I often fear the arrival of frost and hail when my crops will wither and fall like the grass and weeds. I plant beans beneath the southern mountain. The grass flourishes, but bean sprouts are few. I wake up early to clear out the wild brush and return home with the moon and hoe on my shoulder. The path is narrow as the grass and trees grow thick. The evening dew wets my clothes. Wet clothes are not worth begrudging. Just let my hope not be in vain. It's been long since I've enjoyed the mountains and marshes and given release to the pleasure of the forests and wilds. So I take my children and their cousins by the hand and we part the brush walking to a desolate village. We pace and wander among tombs and graves, lingering where the previous inhabitants once lived. The spots for wells and fireplaces are still there. The decayed stumps of bamboo and mulberry trees remain. I ask someone gathering firewood, what happened to all these people? He responded to me saying, they are dead and gone, none are left. In one generation, the court and market change. These are truly not empty words. Life is a dreamlike transformation. In the end, we return to bare nothingness. With deep sorrow, I come back with only my walking stick winding through a rugged path covered with bushes. The mountain brook is clear and shallow, and so I use it to wash my feet. I strain my recently brewed wine and prepare a chicken to gather the neighbors. As the sun sets, the room darkens. A small fire replaces the candle's light. We delight in getting together and grieve that night is so short. Another dawn has already arrived. So the poem mentions several relevant themes, including talk of the author's natural dispositions discussed in terms of ziran, the inevitability of change discussed in terms of hua, 
and the author's relationship with the changes or transformations of the world he inhabits. This presentation will argue that Tao recognized a tension between being himself and the natural transformations of the world. While he advocated a kind of naturalism or ziran zhuyi, he did not believe that he, or human beings in general, were predisposed to accept the inevitable changes of the world. Hence, his naturalism is not necessarily about fitting into his natural surroundings. Despite the fact that he relies on these surroundings in his poetry, and that contemporary scholars sometimes see his work as pastoral. Through an examination of returning to live on the farmstead and several other poems, I will demonstrate two things. One, that Tao saw human beings as distinct from the other myriad creatures who otherwise accept or fit into the natural transformations of the world. And two, that while Tao understood Ziran as being himself, he often saw Hua, or these transformations of the world, as threats to him being himself. I will begin, however, by situating my reading in contemporary scholarship on Tao, much of which fails to detail this tension. Among the secondary scholarship on Tao Yuanming, a common position is that Tao advocated a kind of harmony with the natural world. With limited time here, I'll simply cite two more recent and relevant examples. In 2013, King Kuk Chung, a professor of literature at UCLA, wrote an article comparing Tao with Ralph Waldo Emerson. <clears throat> in it, she writes, For both Tao Qian and Emerson, it is through communion with nature that humankind can get in touch with the sacred core of their beings, she continues. This healing and restorative power of nature is more than physical. The two writers look to nature for existential, intellectual, and moral edification, as well as for poetic and philosophical inspiration. Both find in plants the template of carefree and glorious living. The second example comes from a book written by Lu Shuyuan, a professor of literature at Suzhou University, which was published in 2012 and translated into English in 2016. In Chinese, the book is titled Tao Yuanming the Youling, or Specters of Tao Yuanming, which is a play on Jacques Derrida's 1993 book, Specters of Marx, itself an allusion to the opening line of the Communist Manifesto. Derrida's book argues for the lingering relevance of Karl Marx in our contemporary world. Lu's book was awarded the Lushun Prize for Literature in 2014. The English title of the book is different from the Chinese. In English, it spells out the contemporary relevance of Tao's thought more explicitly. The title is The Ecological Era in Classical Chinese Naturalism, a Case Study of Tao Yuanming. And as you can guess, the book uses Tao's work as a specter of sorts to construct an ecological argument relevant for the modern world. Mary Evelyn Tucker, director of the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale University and scholar of Japanese Confucianism, <coughs> wrote the foreword for the translation. In it, she states that Tao Yuanming's work enables a, quote, return to the universe. In the book itself, Lu develops this line of thought, <coughs> describing Tao as a, quote, literary ecologian, a sheng tai wan shui jia, who writes ecological poetry, sheng tai shi, Lu's motivation is the contemporary environmental crisis, he argues. <clears throat> the most essential question that the academia, East or West, faces is to rethink and readjust the relationship between man and nature in order to alleviate, if not solve, the world's eco crisis and to promote peace and harmony. <clears throat> For Lu, Tao Yuanming provides a way forward. Given the gravity of nature, Tao Yuanming, as a nature poet, an avatar of nature, is destined to resurrect in a new synthesis of Oriental and Occidental philosophies. More specifically, Lu claims, <clears throat> Tao may help people today who are wandering in the barren spiritual wilderness to reorient themselves, to clean the sky and the land, to search for the lost spirituality of man. Tao's literary world and the tradition he represents are explored in order to evoke an innocent, pure, and simple soul, a soul that enables man to rediscover nature, to live harmoniously with nature and to integrate him with nature when society is materialized and commercialized, when nature is overburdened, if not exhausted, and when man is deprived of his soul or spirituality. Okay, so here we have two examples of scholars taking Tao as a nature poet. His goal, according to them, is to harmonize with nature because in it we find the core of our being in true serenity. Chung claims that Tao advocated, quote, living closer to nature and being at one with the environment, 
as a means of self-cultivation. <coughs> and the view of Lu Xuyuan, Tao can help us avert our ecological crisis. If we compare these views with returning to live on the farmstead, there are a number of tensions. For one, despite the fact that Tao describes himself as naturally rooted in a love of hills and mountains, he actually works quite hard against aspects of nature to cultivate his farm. Not only does he have to clear the wilds to make way for his crops, leaving at sunrise and returning home after dark, but he constantly worries that his crops will be destroyed by natural forces. To be sure, the interpretations of, of Cheng, Lu, and many others are not entirely wrong. If we take a couple of Tao's poems in isolation, we can arrive largely at the same reading. Tao is often seen by contemporary interpreters as advocating a kind of naturalism or ziran ju yi. While the term ziran is important for Tao, it only appears four times in his collected works. I've already quoted three of them here. In a general sense, the term ziran, as used in early Chinese literature, refers to things acting without calculation or without force, as in not forcing oneself to do something. Christoph Harbsmeyer, in a broad textual study of the term, argues that ziran is translatable as to be naturally so. In some early texts, such as the Laozi, ziran is associated with terms such as dao or tian, which connect ziran with the way in which the world goes through processes of creative transformation. In texts such as the Zhuangzi, which build on claims like those in the Laozi, the world is seen as spontaneously according with the Tao, and human action on the world is often seen as that which pushes the world out of sync with the Tao. The challenge in this perspective is for humans to act naturally, and the problem of acting naturally is a particularly human problem, since of all things in the world, only humans tend not to be Ziran. In this regard, human beings can, although do not necessarily have to, look to non-human things in the world as models of sorts for understanding Ziran. However, at the same time, human beings are not seen as ontologically distinct from the rest of the world as all things are endowed with and interconnected by the ordering patterns of the cosmos. This is a significant contrast with the English term natural world as it is often used as a way of expressing the difference between what is seen as created by humans in contrast with what is seen as coming forth by non-human means. Frequently in this view, humans are seen as ontologically separate from the rest of the world. Such a concept is not readily found in Chinese texts, although it is translated into contemporary Chinese as ziran jie or da ziran. This association with the English term nature and the Chinese term ziran has led to much discussion about the role of Chinese thought in ecology and <coughs> environmentalism. In an article titled, <coughs> Rethinking Environmental Issues in a Taoist Context, Why Taoism Is and Is Not Environmentalism, Paul D'Ambrosio discusses the relationship between ziran and terms like the natural world. Relying in part on the work of other contemporary scholars, D'Ambrosio shows that ziran in early Taoist texts often refers to ban xing or the specific characteristics, tendency, or propensity that any given thing has. In other words, all things in the world, including humans, have a ban xing, and to be ziran is to be in tune with this ban xing. The Ambrosio continues. According to this reading, the respect and admiration for ziran that is found in both the Laozi and the Zhuangzi is not one for some non-human nature which should be emulated, but for something that is shared by humans and non-humans alike. When these texts discuss following ziran, they are referring to the sage's ability to follow their own natural tendencies without trying to act in accordance with any fixed models or notions of proper relationship, including nature or ethics. In other words, the regard that Taoism holds for ziran has nothing to do with ziran jie or nature, but speaks instead to the original tendency all things have. It is a ziran of how, not of what. The Ambrosio's relevant point is that the so-called natural world is not something that humans have to connect with in order to realize themselves. Rather, self-realization is predicated on understanding one's ban xing, and these natural tendencies have no necessary relationship with non-human creations. Plants as such follow a mode of intentionless or spontaneous action and in some way might be said to provide a model of such action. 
but they do not provide a fixed model in the sense of advocating an ideal for habitat. In other words, plants, in as much as they provide a model, provide a model of how to act and not a model of what to do. Ziran, as such, is an authentic form of action. It is to act naturally. These actions, however, may or may not be ecological. In the centuries between Zhuangzi and Tao Yuanming, the notion of Ziran was developed in various ways. Nevertheless, Tao uses Ziran in senses similar to the accounts offered by Harbs Meyer and D'Ambrosio. In the line quoted at the beginning of this presentation, for example, Tao claims that his natural disposition is to be Ziran, and that remaining a government official was forcing himself to go against these natural dispositions. In returning to live on the farmstead, he also explains that his nature was rooted in a love of hills and mountains. He then goes on to say that in returning home, he could finally go back to a state of Ziran. While the association of Tao's nature, or Xing, with hills and mountains might suggest a claim about the power of the non-human world to provide a kind of genuine context for human self-realization, the association instead seems to be a call for acting in accordance with one's natural dispositions, or ban xing, which for Tao happens to entail a close proximity to hills and mountains. Interestingly, in returning to live on the farmstead, the only other appearance of the term hills, or qiu, is in the, in the description of the tombs, or grave mounds, which are also the same character, Chiu, that Tao and his family wander around, which give way to his melancholy reflection on the transience of human life. Additionally, the next appearance of the term mountain, or Shan, occurs in the context of Tao's struggle to grow beans that cannot compete with the fast-growing grass. While in Tao's poetry, these non-human things often provide a context where Tao expresses an intimate connection with them, at the same time, they do not provide the kind of normative model for self-realization that many interpreters advocate. Indeed, as I detail momentarily, these natural things can be as threatening as they are inspiring. For Tao, there are distinctive aspects in being human. While he does not see a division between a human world and a natural world, he does see human beings as having distinctive features, which make human life significantly different from non-human, particularly plant life. In a poem titled Body, Shadow, and Spirit, Tao personifies three aspects of human beings, bringing them into dialogue with each other on the question of how to cope with the inevitability of death. The poem begins with body, stating, Heaven and earth are constant without end. Mountains and rivers do not change with time. Grass and trees have an unending principle. With dew they flourish and with frost they break. It is human beings that are the most awise and wear and they alone that are not like these other things. All of a sudden they appear in the midst of the world, and in a flash they leave without hope of return. Body describes human beings as unlike the heavens and the earth or mountains and rivers, which seem to have no end. Even plants, which wither in the frost, come back to life with the fresh dews of spring. Human beings, in contrast, are not enduring like mountains and do not return to life like plants. Additionally, Human beings, as the most sentient of beings, are profoundly aware of this difference. The other two personified figures in the poem, shadow and spirit, come to disagree with body's proposed method of coping with this condition. However, they do not disagree with body's description of it. In a much longer poem titled, Moved by Scholars Not Encountering the Right Times, Tao expresses a similar idea. The poem begins, Alas, when this large pile of clay receives animation, why is it that only humans are aware? As I will discuss momentarily, Tao explains this awareness in various ways. However, he expresses the basic difference between human beings and many other things in the world quite succinctly in a poem lamenting the death of his cousin. There, Tao simply states, things endure while we fade away. Tao's assortment of miscellaneous poems detail the contrast between human beings and other things in the world. In the first poem, Tao states, we live without root or stem, blown about like dust on a path, scattered and expelled by twists of wind. This is certainly not an enduring form. Unlike plants, which are rooted in a stable location, human beings are mobile, not fixed. Since we do not have a permanent location and are capable of mobility, we, can't, we can seek to find a place where we fit in. 
If we are lucky, we will find such a place, and in Tao's terms, we can return to it. If we are not lucky, we will wander, however, from place to place, blown about by the winds of fate. In this poem, Tao also uses the plant imagery to segue into a discussion about the way in which ourselves do not last long in comparison with other things in the world. Like the poet's realization when conversing with the firewood gatherer and returning to live on the farmstead, times change before human beings are ready for change. As Tao says in the first miscellaneous poem, If you meet the right moment, you must work hard. Months and years do not wait on us. This theme of being dislocated in time occurs throughout Tao's miscellaneous poems. A third poem states, The sun and moon have their revolving cycles, but when I die, I will not rise again. The second poem reads, Days and months toss people aside, our ambitions do not reach their aim. And the seventh poem, describing the cycle of time, says, The sun and moon are unwilling to slow down, the four seasons press upon and compel each other. The picture Tao paints is one where human beings are not only different from other things in the world, but the world itself competes with human beings to the point that we are at odds with other forces in the world. Time, manifest in the physical forms of the sun and moon, push us aside as they move on their way. These celestial bodies maintain an endless cycle while we have only one rotation. In a poem that Tao writes after drinking wine, he states, Living in hard times, I lack helping hands. Untamed brush runs wild in my homestead. In rows there are flying birds. In silence, no visitors leave traces. How vast is the universe, and how seldom does human life exceed a century. This poem is important for two reasons. For one, Tao again stresses the disconnect between human beings and the world we inhabit. Part of the universe, or while the universe expands indefinitely, our lives rarely extend more than 100 years. Part of being human means a finite existence, and part of being human also means an acute awareness of our finitude. The second reason this poem is important is because of Tao's description of the untamed brush. As we saw in returning to live on the farmstead, where untamed grass threatened Tao's bean crops, plant life in this poem threatens Tao's homestead. This is not an uncommon theme in Tao's work. These kinds of descriptions are found in at least half a dozen poems. In the very next poem, Tao writes in the Drinking Wine series, for instance, Tao likewise states that his front courtyard is covered with wild grass. The image of wild plants growing in what were once domesticated spaces occurs especially often in poems related to death. In one poem lamenting the death of his cousin, Tao describes how year-old grass blankets the front courtyard. In a poetic essay lamenting the death of his sister, Tao states, Winter has gone and summer has arrived. The days and months slowly push us apart. Dust collects on the rafters, and grass in the courtyard grows wild with weeds. In these poems, Tao highlights the ways in which plant life threaten aspects of human living. This is not an acute threat in the sense that plants jeopardize any one human life in a particular moment. Rather, this is a general and gradual threat because plant life has something that human life does not have namely time. Plants in Tao's view follow the cycle of the seasons and withering and flourishing, every year extending their reach. While human beings have their 100 years, plants seem to have much more. In the fourth stanza of returning to live on the farmstead, Tao describes a visit to a desolate village where only the ruins of fireplaces and wells remained. Tao and his family wander around the graves of his former inhabitants. These are the only remnants of human existence. Tao seems perplexed by this. How could human living not be marked by something more grand? Part of the power of this poem is Tao's realization that the things that he values are not necessarily valued by the world he inhabits. Human beings work hard to be remembered, but in the end, there is little left to identify us. In the broad scheme of things, human existence is not a necessary existence for the continued survival of the world and the world itself works against our remembrances. Said more starkly, it's only a matter of time before the memorials we construct will be covered with weeds. In returning to live on the farmstead, Tao likens human living to a dreamlike transformation, thereby highlighting, among other things, the brevity of life. In the end, he says, we will return to bear nothingness. These lines do not point to a comforting notion of existence. 
For the purposes of this presentation, I want to focus on the use of Tao's term, shu, meaning bare or empty in this case. In the first stanza, shu appears alongside with the character wu, or nothingness, and seems to have a positive meaning. In my home, he says, there is no dust or disorder. A bare room allows for plenty of repose. The second stanza similar, similarly employs shu positively. A bare room keeps out dusty thoughts. In both of these cases, the emptiness of Tao's home represents or allows for a life unencumbered by worry. When dusty thoughts are cut off, a reference similar to the dusty net of official life in the first stanza, one can live in a carefree manner. However, when his crops struggle in the third stanza and he visits the ruins of a village in the fourth stanza, Shu does not seem to be wholly positive. When asking about the village ruins, Tao is told the people are dead and gone, none are left. Tao then quotes what appears to be a common saying about the court and market changing every generation. This saying refers to the speed at which circumstances change. Over a period of 20 or 30 years, the people involved in a particular sphere of activity will be slowly replaced such that a completely new group of people eventually occupy the same space. Thus, what was once familiar becomes largely foreign. In commenting on this phrase, Tao states, these are truly not empty words. Tao then comments on the brevity of life and as mentioned previously states that in the end we return to bare nothingness. His usage of shu in these two lines is somewhat different than the way he uses it earlier in the poem. The emptiness of his house contrasts with the emptiness of the village. The emptiness of his home allows for repose, but the emptiness of the village provides a remainder of the emptiness of human existence. The saying about the court and market changing every generation is not empty in the sense that it fills Tao with apprehension. Being shu is positive in that it describes a state of being without worry, yet Tao's realization of the emptiness of life is the very thing that fills him with worry. As he wanders around the graves, which seem to bear no identity, he comes to understand that in the end we die, are buried, and the earth will cover us over until nothing remains. So for Tao, emptiness allows for repose, but emptiness also haunts him. It turns out that in his pursuit of a carefree life, Worry is unavoidable, since emptiness is built into the world humans inhabit. The fifth stanza of the poem describes how Tao copes with this worry. The point worth stressing here is that many of Tao's central concepts work like shu. At face value, they seem to be positive, but on closer inspection, these terms have poignant aspects to them. Etymologically, poignant is related to the words meaning prick or pierce, and is quite apt in describing these aspects. It conveys a sense of joy tinged by reflective sorrow. For Tao, concepts such as shu entail these very feelings. Similar to shu, the concept hua also has poignant aspects. So while Tao in some places appears to rejoice in the natural transformations of the world, in other places he appears much more ambivalent. At the outset of this presentation, I mentioned poems where Tao seems to accept or look forward to these hua. The vast majority of times Tao uses Hua, however, suggests not only a lingering sorrow associated with Hua, but that these Hua, as aspects of the world we inhabit, threaten our prospects of being ourselves. In a poem that highlights themes of changing times, utilizing the imagery of courts and markets, Tao stresses the disconcerting aspects of Hua. The poem is titled, Resp Responding to Attendant Zhang at the End of the Year, and it's on the handout. In its entirety, the poem reads, Visiting the market, I grieve old friends, and am moved as the sun gallops into the evening pool. With tomorrow's morning, there will be no more today. As the year ends, what can I say? This fresh face has lost its luster, and white hairs have multiplied. How off target were the words of Duke Mu, but physical strength is not yet gone. As evening comes, a distant wind arises, Wintry clouds cover the western mountains. Biting and sharp, the air becomes harsh. In a rush and muddle, flying birds return home. People's lives rarely last long, and worse yet, are wrapped in toil and worry. Yet again, no good wine arrives, and I have nothing with which to rejoice in the current year. Success and failure are not worth fretting over, yet I am withered and wearied by transformation and change. I clutch myself, bearing deep affection. The turns of time increase my regret. 
This melancholy poem expresses several themes already discussed in this presentation, including the fleeting nature of time and the speed with which the world changes. It also explicitly refers to the way in which Hua wither and weary the author, despite his attempt to be unconcerned with success and failure. In addition to this poem, Tao expresses his ambivalence in several other poems. In one titled, in one titled, the ninth day of the ninth month in the year 409, Tao writes, the transformation of the world seek after and follow upon each other. How could human life not be hard? From antiquity all have had to die, but thinking of it worries my heart. What can I use to calm my feelings? With cloudy wine I'll please myself. I do not know about 1,000 years, so for the moment I'll use this to lengthen today. Here Tao describes the toil or arduousness as a necessary part of life due to the natural transformations of the world. Given the unrelenting character of these transformations, human life cannot but be hard. Interestingly, the content of this poem is purposefully ironic in light of its title. The term nine or jiu is a homophone for the term long lasting, also pronounced jiu in modern Chinese. And in Tao's time, the ninth day of the ninth month was commonly associated with longevity. In other words, this double nine day was a time where many people focused on practices they believed could extend their lives. In this poem, however, rather than pursuing the theme of longevity or immortality, Tao resigns himself to the inevitability of death, attempting to take comfort in his home-brewed elixir of wine that can do little more than prolong the day. Transformation in this sense is so inescapable that not only is death certain, but life itself is a struggle in the midst of incessant change. So while Tao has his moments of embracing the transformations of the world, he also has his moments of cynicism. As a matter of fact, even in places where Tao endorses these hua, he often goes on to highlight its poignant aspects. For instance, in the elegy Tao writes for himself, he describes himself as someone who took joy in heaven and accepted his lot until the end of his days. Shortly after this line, Tao states, I have now been transformed and can be without regret. Yet despite these statements, Tao closes his elegy as follows. Cold and hot quickly pass by, Death is certainly different from life. My wife's relatives arrive in the morning and close friends hurry over in the evening. Buried in the midst of the wilds where souls are put to rest, I am carried with a somber mood. The tomb's gate creaks open. The extravagance of Song is shameful and the frugality of Wang Sun is laughable. Empty and extinct, remorseful and remote, no mound or tree marks the grave. Days and months quickly pass by. Not valuing praise before, who would care about songs of adoration after? Life is certainly hard. Is death like life? Alas, oh, alas. This is not the voice of someone who has fully embraced the transformations of the world. Here we see that even if Tao accepted his lot in life and died without regret, he does not transform without lamenting the difficulty of life or worrying about the possible difficulties of his next form. Tao's ambivalence about the natural transformations of the world stands in sharp contrast with portions of the Zhuangzi, a text that Tao is otherwise fond of. The Zhuangzi's views on Hua are especially relevant as displayed in a vignette about Zisi, Ziyu, Zili, and Zilai. Four friends, united in recognizing life and death, existence and non-existence as one continuous form. The passage explains that Ziyu became ill his body literally falling apart. Zisi visited him and asked whether or not Ziyu detested his bodily changes. Ziyu responded with surprise, rejoicing in the possibility that his left arm might eventually be transformed or hua into a rooster that would greet the morning sun, or that his butt might be transformed into a wheel that would roll around the world, he further added. I obtained this form because it was time and will lose it as time moves on. In according with time and dwelling in its movements, sorrow and joy cannot touch you. This is what the ancients called loosening the bind. Those who cannot loosen themselves will be bound by things. Nothing can conquer heaven. That's the way it's always been. What would I have to detest? Thus, for Ziyu, transformation was something grand, something celebrated and not feared. The story continues. 
saying that a little while later, Zelai fell ill and was about to die. As his family wept over him, Zeli arrived, chastising his family, saying, Hey, get out! Don't disturb this transformation. On his deathbed, Zelai told Zeli, If a great metalsmith were casting metal and metal were to jump up and say, I must be made into the finest sword, the smith would certainly think it was odd metal. And so if one happens to have a human form to say, only a human, I want to be only a human, the process of creation and transformation would certainly think that this was an odd person. And so I take heaven and earth as a great furnace and creation and transformation as a great smith. Where could I be sent and it not be right? According to Zillai, creation and transformation make what they will with things in the world. Humans can no more decide to be human any more than metal can decide to be a sword. A person might even desire to remain human far beyond the normal lifetime allotted for human beings, but people cannot control the process of transformation. Humans will be made into whatever it is that things go on to become, and we can protest this process or we can rejoice in it. However, much like the Zhuangzi's praying mantis trying to stop the wagon wheel, we cannot halt the process of transformation. In part, the Zhuangzi argues for a view of existence that transcends anthropocentrism. If we come to see things beyond our limited human perspectives, we will understand that human living is but one limited form of existence, and that the world will continue on long after human beings are gone, as the world presumably did before human beings appeared. Franklin Perkins captures this quite nicely in an essay titled Wandering Beyond Tragedy with Zhuangzi. In this article, Perkins argues that the Zhuangzi advocates a comedic or playful perspective on the world, a view that goes beyond optimistic views of the world, where the world is seen as programmed to respond to human concerns, and pessimistic views that see the world as unresponsive to human concerns. In the end, Zhuangzi's view is comedic in that he recognizes the unresponsive nature of the world. Yet rather than protest it, as one would do in a tragic view, Zhuangzi asks us to embrace it and wander in the transformations of the world, as if playing a series of games or situations we commit ourselves to, knowing their arbitrary and meaningless nature. Perkins explains that the problem with optimism and pessimism is that they both maintain the centrality of human goals and values, whereas Zhuangzi advocates a, quote, radical rejection of the limits of human perspective. Perkins states, the optimist goes furthest by projecting these human categories into the structure of the world itself. The pessimist, though, retains enough confidence to say that the world is bad. One might fall back to a weaker position, not that the world is bad in some objective sense, but that it is necessarily bad for us. Even this assumption, which amounts to a claim about human nature, remains too committed to the human for Zhuangzi. According to Perkins, optimism and pessimism miss the mark in that they fail to shed light beyond human interest, whereas Zhuangzi advocates a broader perspective. Perkins explains this as a playful perspective where we quite literally do not take ourselves too seriously. So, according to Perkins, the Zhuangzi admits that the world we inhabit is indifferent to our desires, Yet the proper attitude to take up is not lamentation, resentment, or protest. Rather, the proper attitude is one that goes beyond tragedy in accepting the world as it is. In short, the opposite of taking ourselves seriously is, in Zhuangzi's comedic view, to take ourselves humorously, a view we see when Zhuangzi celebrates the death of his wife, for instance. It is my contention that where Tao differs from the Zhuangzi, is in Tao's inability to relinquish the seriousness of his existence. While Tao has his Zhuangzian moments, he never remains committed to them for long. Building on Perkins' language, Tao is a pessimist in the weak sense. He does not see the world as necessarily bad, but he does see it as bad for him in the sense that it offers no guarantee that he will live long enough to enjoy being himself. And neither does it guarantee that any memory of him will remain. We can go one step further given the poems quoted previously, including Tao's visit to the ruins and returning to live in the farmstead, and say that while Tao sees the world as indifferent to his desires, he believes the desire to remain or the desire to matter in the world is widely shared among humans, and that our awareness of the limitations the world presents 
to fulfilling this desire imbue human life with a certain kind of grief. <laughs> this is best illustrated in the third poem of Imitating Burial Songs. Tao writes this series of poems from the perspective of the deceased as parts of the mourning rites occur, including the viewing, procession, and interment. This third poem describes the interment, which you find on your handout. Wild grass grows on and on. The leaves of poplar trees rustle in the wind. Harsh frost falls in the ninth month. They send me beyond the outskirts of town. No one lives anywhere nearby. Lofty tombs jut out all around. The buyer-pulling horses whinny as they look up into the sky. The wind hums a mournful tune. Once this dark room is closed, there will not be another morning for a thousand years. There will not be another morning for a thousand years, so what use is being worthy and great? Those who came along to send me on the, my way have all returned to their homes. Perhaps my relatives have some lingering sorrow, but everyone else is already singing a happy tune. After death, what can be said? My body is lodged at one with the mountainside. This poem ties together several themes of this presentation with, for instance, wild grass threatening to cover human remains and the poet being buried in the ninth month. Also of interest is the mountain that the poem's body is placed in. If Tao delights in nature, specifically mentioning mountains and returning to live on the farmstead, one would expect a mountain to be a fitting place for him to return. Yet in this poem, nature is not so welcome. The tomb, set in the context of grass and mountains, is a lonely and isolated place. The isolation is expressed not only with regard to the fact that no one lives anywhere nearby, but also in the poet's description of his family and friends. The morning rites at Tao's time discouraged people from singing, as singing was seen as an expression of joyful feelings not appropriate for mourning. The notion that people have already begun to sing suggests that they no longer have feelings of sorrow, that they no longer mourn for the deceased. Tao clearly desires to matter to others, and the poem elicits a somber mood as the poet realizes how hard it is to remain meaningful. The point here is that even in what seems to be Tao's idyllic situation, resting in a bare room, removed from society, tucked away in a mountainside wilderness, Tao is still not at ease. The transience of life is a major theme in Tao's poetry. We find it not only in returning to live on the farmstead, but also in the adjacent poems in Tao's collected works. The poem Residing in Leisure on the Ninth Day is another poem written on a double nine day, where the popular concern with longevity leads to a contrary impulse for Tao, who instead reflects on the ephemeral nature of life. Tao writes on the handout, Life is short, yet our hopes are long and many, which is why people delight in long life. This day and month have arrived in accordance with the seasons, and all people love its name. The dew is brisk, the warm winds have ceased, the air is clean, the sky is clear. The shadows of departing swallows no longer remain, the sound of arriving geese echoes. Wine will push out all concerns, and chrysanthemums will halt the waning years. But what of the man in the rustic hut? Empty, he watches the turns of time. The dusty cup disgraces the bare bottle. In vain, these cold flowers bloom. Fixing my robe, I leisurely sing to myself. Distant reflections stir deep feelings. Settling into this perch certainly brings many joys. And so, why would just hanging on not be an achievement? In this poem, Tao introduces another important theme of being human, namely, that our aspirations in life outpace the time we have to achieve those aspirations. Part of this appears to come from ideas found in the 19 old poems, a collection of poetry from the second half of the Han Dynasty that Tao often alludes to. The 15th poem, which takes up the theme of seeking pleasure in the brevity of life, begins with the lines, We live for but a hundred years, yet bear the burdens of a thousand. The idea here is that we recognize that the time we have to live is disproportionate to the concerns we often bear. Human beings are able to worry about far more things than we can actually address. We worry about the uncertainty of the future and sorrow over the frustrations of the past. We fret over periods long before we were born and long after we will die. These kinds of poems also suggest that we are capable of worrying about things in the present that go beyond our power to control. 
And so Tao is reminded on this day of longevity that human life is actually quite short and that we must come to terms with the bald fact that we desire far more than life will allow. For Tao, our desires are a kind of ironic remainder. The courts and markets change in a generation and only traces remain of a village not long after it's abandoned. Yet our hopes stand in contrast to the nature of the world and the lifespan of human beings. This is ironic in that while human beings desire to remain for more than our lifetime, the only thing guaranteed to go beyond it are our unfinished hopes. For Tao, what remains is fated to be left undone. In the poem immediately following Returning to Live on the Farmstead, titled An Outing to Shea Brook, Tao again highlights themes of transience, this time in the company of friends. In the preface to the poem, Tao says that on the fifth day of the fifth month in 421, he went with two or three neighbors to Shea Brook. While enjoying the scenery, a series of terraced hills jutting out from the marshland caught their attention. These hills reminded them of Mount Kunlun, a mythical mountain supposedly inhabited by immortals. Similar to the double, to the, uh, double nine days, where longevity reminds Tao of the brevity of life, these terraced hills remind Tao that life is transient, Tao explains. We sorrowed over the swift passing of days and months and grieved that our years would not remain. These hills, which symbolize permanence and immortality, trigger reflections on human finitude. In response to this, Tao states, each of us recorded his age and birthplace in order to remember the day. Thus, in response to the ephemeral nature of human life, Tao and his companions engage in an act of permanence. They mark their existence by recording time, place, and name. The poem itself reads, which is the last one on the handout. The year begins and suddenly I'm 50. My life ebbs toward its return to rest. Thinking about it stirs my soul. And so this morning I take a trip. The air is mild and the sky is clear. We arrange our seats next to the far flowing stream. In the weak rapid silver bream race, in the deep valley, chattering seagulls fly. Over broad marshland we cast our wandering eyes and reflectively gaze at the terraced hills. Although it pales in comparison to ninefold peak, in looking around it cannot be matched. Tilting the bottle, I welcome my companions. Cups are filled and toasts are made. I don't know if after today there will be another moment like this. In the midst of drinking, we set free our roaming wishes forgetting this thousand years of worry. And so we exhaust today's pleasures, for tomorrow they are not to be found. Similar to returning to live on the farmstead, Tao makes an outing or a trip. In that poem, he explains that he wanted to go to mountains and marshes. Instead, he ends up at a deserted village. In this poem, however, Tao actually makes it to the marshes and mountains. Interestingly though, the result is nearly the same. The impermanence of the village and the permanence of the mountain remind Tao of the transience of human life. An outing to Shia Brook more explicitly alludes to the line from the 19 old poems about bearing the burdens of a thousand years. The frivolity of the moment allows Tao and his friends to forget their thousand years of worry. Yet similar to returning to live on the farmstead, the coming day is a reminder that the moment must come to an end. Borrowing a phrase from Alexander Huang's work on tragedy in pre-modern Chinese literature, there is a kind of tyranny of time in these poems. Time passes is uncaring and even crushing. And as human beings, we are ever conscious of our place in time. Yet as Tao demonstrates in his poetry, time can be temporarily halted when good company is present. Friendship can lengthen the moment. This kind of living in the moment for Tao means a trimming away of the past and future where the moment in front of him is the only moment that matters. In these poems, Tao gets caught up and carried away with friends, seeming to transcend the problem of time. But the world itself calls him back to remind him that the tyrant of time can be managed, but never conquered. Thank you.